So we're going to get started with the second half of our program here tonight. Uh, I, I promise that uh, we'll, we'll be wrapped up here by about 7 o'clock. Uh, but I, I, I want to take a moment to introduce uh, these fine gentlemen next to me, Brad Johnson from Tryon Distributing, Distributing and Jeff Mims from Mims Distributing. Thank you guys for uh, joining the second half of our discussion. How about a round of applause for these guys? Cheers. <laughs> So we're going to sort of switch gears a little bit from sort of that, that brewery end of things and, and thinking about uh, the operations and the decision making on, on the brewery side and move over to the wholesaler side and talk a little bit about how uh, craft brewers can work with instead of against their wholesale partners to, to build some of these brands that we've discussed uh, already today. Um, and sort of in this environment uh, of a lot of new SKUs uh, entering the marketplace. I think I said it earlier, but there's you know, something like 600 uh, new SKUs on average coming out uh, every year from craft brewers. So that's a lot to manage uh, from the wholesale end of things. And um, you know, uh, uh, Sean sort of touched on it earlier, saying that you know, there was one brewer in particular that he was friends with that had five SKUs, had to pare them down to three, and really focus in on what's moving and what's selling. Um, so these guys are going to sort of talk a little bit about that and, and how they have that discussion with craft brewers. Um, so uh, let's just start with you guys as we did uh, earlier and, and talk a little bit about your guys' business. Brad, I'll start with you. Um, introduce, you know, try on for those that are watching at home that might not know and kind of what, what are some of your core brands that you guys are selling and um, tell us a little bit about try on and then we'll move over to Jeff. Very cool. Hello, is it working? Yes, okay. Try on distributing. Uh, we turned 29 years ago last week. Uh, Congratulations. Cheers, 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 cheers. I was a crazy 26 year old kid going, what am I going to do with my life? And uh, started, I was actually in the service industry in restaurants, and all of a sudden I realized. I didn't want to be in the service industry. I wanted to service the service industry. So uh, started a wine and beer company, you know, uh, way back then, and it was maybe 2% beer and the rest, you know, was wine. And over the years, uh, we have grown around the state, and we're now a statewide distributor. So the four people that started the company is now 218 people, and uh, we are now 49% beer because of the craft explosion. We, we got on the craft a long time ago, and it is working, working. Now, the one thing I got to say is I am blessed with some of the best North Carolina craft beers. Sean here at Full Steam. Here is Paul and Robert, you know, from Duck Rabbit. Trent you know, from Mother Earth. I'm working with Oscar, you know, who is the biggest one, you know, Highlands Brewing, incredible. And uh, I'm working with John at Old Mecklenburg for his off-premise. And I'm also working with the brand new brewery, Brad, uh, at Unknown Brewing that is getting ready to open. And, and if you noticed, I, you know, I, I, I said the guy's names before the brewery. Yeah. Because you know what? That's who it really is. It's the guys. You've got brands out there, but you've got people behind these brands, and that's what it's really all about. So it's a relationship business. It is a total relationship business. Paul's my brother. i got to love him. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, these relationships, uh, how has how, that translated to case sales for Tryon in, in terms of beer? How many cases did you guys sell last year? We were over a million cases of beer. Yeah, so it's hard to keep up with, you know? Yeah. And uh, Jeff, how about you? Well, MIMS Distributing. Am I on? MIMS Distributing was uh, established in 1964. My dad and uncle bought the distributorship. The biggest brand they had then was Falstaff. Can't even see the brand anymore. It's kind of amazing. <laughs> A small brand, Miller Lite, came out in 1975, which pretty much changed the business. And it's also, I believe, it's the time with Carter when they changed the excise tax law where they gave a discount to smaller breweries, which yeah. changed the landscape, which brought us to where we are today. Because in the 70s, it was the lowest that the uh, suppliers had been as far as number of permits in the country in some time. And you, you all know, know the numbers. You've just seen it grow over the time. We're um, coming up on our 50th year this year. 
Uh, I'm a punk. <laughs> I was uh, raised unloading trains <laughs> and getting paid in pizza is, yeah. is where I started out uh, with my three brothers. But we're um, three and a half million cases. We are Miller House, Yingling, Sam Adams, Lagunitas, and our, our big brands, North Carolina, is Foothills, which y'all may have heard of, and Carolina Brewing Company. We're glad to have them. Awesome. Um, but we're glad to, glad to be here. What else you got, Chris? Well, I, I got a few more questions queued up here. So, <laughs> um, so let's just start with uh, sort of your selection process. I mean, there's, there's a lot of new brands out there. We'll, we'll kind of move into uh, all the SKUs. But um, there's got to be a lot of people knocking on your doors and asking for you guys to help get them to market. So, uh, you know, are you guys actively looking on to take more brands? And, and what's sort of your criteria for saying yes to a new brand uh, if you're going to take them on? And we'll start with you, Jeff. Looks like you're ready to go. I think it's fair to say we're all looking for new brands. If you're not building new brands, you're failing. Uh, times have changed over the last decade where now you got more prestigious brands. Beer's in demand, especially with the micro sections. Domestics are on the fall. Um, I know, because I got some of them. <laughs> and, uh, but the micros are definitely on the grow. You go into a bar, and you know, the first thing you hear people order, y'all sit there and listen with Brad, and um, give me a local beer. And so they get one, and the question is, is do they get the second one? Because, uh, you know, again, I'll, all I want to say that for is it's the critical mass. Because as a wholesaler, I'm looking at it, if I can't maintain a critical mass consistently, which is, uh, in, in, in our opinion, is a pallet a month which leads to fresh code dates. And then you gotta get into the critical mass for the volume for containers for the transshipment across for wherever you're coming from, which is freight. If you don't have control of freight and code dates, you're done. You're dead in the water. So um, that's a big piece we look at. Uh, you know when you come out, you gotta have faith in the brand and do your distribution and all that stuff, but after about six months, you'll, you'll know whether you got a winner or not. Yeah, we're uh, wine and beer still, and so for us, it, it's really difficult because our warehouse, you know, we've only got our 92,000 square feet that we have, and there's bin locations, and our bin locations are full. We're now doubling them up, so we were very fortunate. We got into this way before my brother here decided that craft beer was cool. And so we got Wait a, a minute. I'm going to rebuttal that one. Okay, Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> so we got a lot of the rock stars. Uh, and so for us, you know, with these rock stars, I mean, we've got to look really hard at what we're going to pick up. Right. And normally these days, if we're picking up, we got to be putting out. Right. At the same time, you know, and there are, you know, certain brands that have, you know, done okay, but not great. There's a lot of imports, you know, that we have that are not holding up anymore that we're looking at that we've got to move out the door to see that we can take advantage of, you know, the same guys that he and I are competing for, you know, the new regional rock stars that are going to come into the market. So, I mean, and that's what we're all dealing with and competing for, you know, are these really cool guys and our local guys that actually have enough product to sell. That's the big deal with locals is they've actually got to have enough to make it make sense to have another bin location in the warehouse, you know, for us to be able to make money, you know. Right. So it sounds like... Um there, there's definitely a certain set of criteria that you guys have when you're analyzing these brands that are knocking on your door. One seems to be uh, uh, production volumes. The second seems to be brand cachet. Uh, are there any others? Uh, brand recognition, brand cachet. Well, are there I, any others? Know, I'm, I'm looking at minimum, you know, two to three thousand barrels. You okay. know, before I would look at the local, local guy, you know, so that I can afford to, you know, put a new bin location in. And, and thankfully here uh, in, in North Carolina, there's self-distribution, so. Yes, amen. And yeah. you know what? 
I love my boys to feel the pain. That's you know, I, I would yeah. agree. I would agree. <laughs> you know. You know. <laughs> exactly, because it's hard. Know, it, it is. It's it's it sucks. You got to have a bunch of trucks and a bunch of people that are out there early in the morning hitting these grocery stores, and and it's really tough. I mean, it really is. And that's but that's what we do. That's who we are, and, and what we're there for. So, um, you know. What we're sort of here to discuss tonight is, is not necessarily how you guys are picking brands. I mean, I'm, I'm curious just, you know, personally how you guys uh, zero in on, on certain brands that you want to pick up, but um, also just how you compete with those brands out in the marketplace. And you know, with all these new uh, brewers sprouting up, all the new SKUs that they're introducing, how tough is it out there specifically in North Carolina uh, when you're talking to the retailers, when you're talking to the big chains, when you're talking to the local bottle shops, uh, what's, what's some of the feedback that you're getting from them and, and not necessarily the feedback that we're getting from our speakers? <laughs> yeah, we're getting a little feedback there. It, 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 it's a tough thing. Actually, one, one of the things that you know, kind of brought some of this conversation up was I read something that the Brewers Association put out that set, was talking to wholesalers. And it said, Mr. Wholesaler, you need to work with all your brewers and you need to let them know that flavor that is not working. There is only so much real estate out there right now. And it's getting, you know, hit on, hit on, hit on constantly. What we've got to look for is the movers, the stuff, as Sean brought up, you know, the stuff that churns, you know, and that's what needs to be on the shelves. And... If somebody's got some crazy wacky, which we love them all, we drink them all, you know, but does that need to be on a shelf in a store? So, uh, and if it's something that's not going to move, the the, be, the Brewers Association was saying, it's you need to let them know, and it's time to go, you know. Right. So, so, Jeff, how do, how do you start evaluating that? Uh, you know, how do you start navigating that conversation with some of your brands? At, um, the buyer at Harris Teeter, Ed Cook. Um, if you don't, the theory used to be with us, if you don't have Harris Teeter, you don't have a brand, because that's the critical mass. And Ed expressed some concerns to us that we're getting to the point in North Carolina, I've even heard this from some of the brewers around the country too, North Carolina is indexed very highly with craft beers. We're blessed to be where we are. Um, we love the beer. And it's getting saturated to the point where they're going to run out of room in the grocery stores where there's only so many great beers that will fit in there. Uh, Ed and well, everyone knows all the micros are buying more capital. Everyone's expanding. So what's going to give? Something is going to give. Is there going to be a hop shortage? Uh, is freight going to go up to $5 a gallon on fuel? I mean, that, that's a killer for, you know, it kills us on trucks. You know, you got, Fuel kills us. Something is going to happen that's going to make a difference. So the major brands are going to get, you know, say Deschutes. You know, they, I think they'll have a hall pass coming into North Carolina. But some of the other ones, you know, what's the point of difference that they're going to bring to the market that's going to go over the retailers? Uh, you see the number of breweries being built. Was it two a day, I think it is right now? The permits being passed through uh, federal, two a day? I mean, that's... Something's going to give, and it's just how do you get in there, the marketing, the presence, uh, if you come in with the, with the volume and the market presence with the local field reps, I think is very important. Um, you get the brands in here, and I know there's so much that we're responsible to do ourselves with, you know, with our staff, but having a personal in here, an ambassador from the brewery, makes a world of a difference. If, if you're picking them up or, 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 or if you've already picked them up and you're, and you're selling in, you, you want feet on the street and investment behind the brand if you're even going to consider them? Yeah, no, because it depends on, because if it's 5,000 cases, they can't afford it. That's up to us to get it going. But if you got the shoots coming in, feet on the street. Right. You know, um, I think feet on the street is extremely important, and I see a lot of our smaller guys doing that because... That's what the competition is doing. Right. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, that's what people are up against is, you know, our local bar 
owners and stuff, they know somebody from the brewery right. because they're hanging out there. My sales staff, we've got 32 craft beers. I mean, 32. I mean, companies. That, 32 yeah, companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, craft breweries. And, you know, that's a lot, you know, for them to sell. But to have the independent, you know, uh, guy having his own guy, Robert, Sean, you know, congratulations, having the people on, on the ground is amazing. And that, that helps out so much that they have the relationship also. Right, right. Um, so let, let, let's get back to this sort of skew proliferation uh, discussion here a little bit. Um, how have you guys adapted to it, uh, your own businesses? And how do you start having that conversation, like you said, you know, uh, the, the BA put out and said, you know, you got to talk to your, your suppliers and say, these are the ones that are moving, these are the ones that aren't. How have you guys adapted uh, your business models to accommodate for all these new SKUs? And how are you guys starting to have the conversation on the other side with the brewers to say, this has to stay and this has to go? We'll start with you. <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> I cry about it every day when I walk through my warehouse and I'm jammed up. I have, I, I honestly, I take every package, every size, every flavor that my guys do to my detriment, you know, to where I've run out of cooler space, I've run out of floor space, it's, it's gotten crazy. And there's going to have to be something. I mean, draft, draft was 12% of my entire business where... You know, beer was 49, draft was 12%. Managing kegs, you know, is a bear. Those empties, they're all 30 bucks to me. You know, I have a guy in a separate warehouse just handling. I sell uh, five, 600 kegs a day, and those come back in, have to get divided out. I have a guy in a whole warehouse just handling empty cooperage. So, yes, at some point, I'm going to have to say, Hang on, guys. You know we only need to look at this, this, and this. You know to make it make sense for the wholesaler. But, but it's, Sorry, guys. It's. <laughs> but it, it's been those uh, sort of innovative products and the rotation and the seasonals and the one-offs and the specialties that are really generating a lot of the excitement and the buzz in the category. Uh, driving uh, this craft movement forward. So how do you how do you balance the two? You have to bring in the odd of brands, the in and outs is what we refer to them at, because that's the excitement with the brands. Everybody's looking for the rotating tap handles, and it's part of the business. You take a brewery, um, and they they but you go to the retailers and you say we're going to allocate the product according to the volume. So if you don't support the brand, you know you don't get the the specialty beer. So that works. But I also want to say, Chris, is that you know, it, we take a lot of pride in uh, the quality and the code dates as far as looking at the warehouse SKUs. Uh, that's first and foremost to us than even to the freight and the cost of goods and profits and everything. If you're over an inventory and you right size it, you fix it and get the dates right, it's one thing. But if you're running into a code date problem in the warehouse, you, you got a problem. You have to address it, whether it's you know, parting paths with a brewery or eliminating skews or something. Something's not working, and it's, it's you have to address the code date issue. It's that's first and foremost. Right. Uh, very, very true. And yes, you're going to take all those cool one-offs and seasonals and all that sort of stuff. Uh, what I was talking about is, do you need four sizes of one flavor? And that's what we're dealing with, with so many different of our, the beers we're carrying. One flavor, four sizes. For craft or for uh, some of the bigger brewers that, that, that Jeff is a little bit more familiar with? Well, they're, they're the masters of, uh, of, of all the SKUs, right? I'll, I'll also say Harris Teeter's eliminated domestic single serves, six packs, and anything under 12 ounces. And they've met some of the stores have taken four feet away from domestics as well and expanded to micros, if y'all haven't seen that. That is a major change going into the market. Interesting. So are you guys able to effectively sell all the products that are being thrown at you? We only sell quality products, Brad. We're, we're <laughs> <laughs> 
of course we're able to sell all the product. I mean, no, well, I told you, we have a, you know, in the door, out the door. And if it's a, if it's a brewery that's not working or a winery that's not working, you know, it's going to be out the door. But we've put our full energy and heart you know, into that brand to come up to the fact that it's not working, but we're not going to hold on to it. So when you, when you say if it's not working, it's out the door, you're, you're, you're able to cut ties with a brand if, if you see fit. You got to, you know. <laughs> Brad and I are good about that. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're good. We don't hold prisoners. Okay. I will say right. that. And, and we will give them away, you know, if it's at, you know, a level that's not working for me. It, you know, life's too short. What's what's usually the reason behind those decisions? Is it is it poor quality liquid? Is it is it branding? Is it? I mean, yeah. what? Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And and it is you know niche in a portfolio also. I mean, if you've got you know fifty certain types of Belgium ales, you know, I mean, you know, fifty one might not work. Right. Right. So. Um, you guys can effectively manage all these SKUs, supposedly, uh, but are retailers able to, you know, take on all these brands? Are bar owners able to say, I, you know, I, I've got a million different breweries. I've got, you know, 100, 200 breweries coming at me every day with different rotating seasonals, and I only got, you know, 25 tap lines. Uh, are retailers able to manage all the SKUs that are out there? And, uh, well, and then I'll ask my follow-up after if depending upon what you say. I'll also toot our horn because I do believe MIMS Distributing and Tryon Distributing has some of the best beer knowledge as wholesalers in the state. I, I will say that. And Chris, it gets back down to the relationships that we have with the retailers. We all, you know, the other distributors in the market, we have quality product. It's the service and the relationships. It's what we do when things go wrong. But, but can they handle all these brands that are coming uh, out? You know, and I apologize, my brothers, if you're watching this, but some of the 150 tap guys, that's overlooked. I mean, it really is. There's going to be some product that is not fresh with 150 taps. Yep. You know, and I, I love them. I sell a hell of a lot of beer to them, you know, but it's still... Can they handle it all? Uh, you know, hey, I don't know. Now, that's draft houses. Now, you're talking right. about bottle shops? Sure. You know, they can put all these products and bottles up, and they're going to sell what they sell. The brand has got to have some leverage. It's got to have some pull. they got to have some legs. You know, and, and that's all we're looking for is a brand that has some legs. Chris, those bottle shops that don't manage the brands well, I give the space to Brad. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> so let's assume that they're managing the space well, that they're able to, to sort of handle all these brands and, and sell them. Maybe, maybe not some of the 100-plus tap houses, but um, they've got all these brands coming out them. How are you guys educating them and, and, and keeping them engaged with the stories behind these brands? Because we heard earlier from Sean that story is such a big part of some of the brands that they're making and the brewery. So, I mean, how many stories can you tell? I mean, there, there, there's this whole theory about, like, you know, how many friends you can actually have in your circle and actually know. So I kind of think the same way about beer. It's like, you know, how many brands as a retailer can you actually effectively sell to the customer? Um, maybe speak to that a little bit. Again, I'll go back on beer knowledge in our, in our company. Every one of our, our salesmen and merchandisers are all uh, server certified. We have four or five Cicerone certified people within our company. We have our own hops field. That I don't think, you know, we work with NC State Agriculture Department that we grew one. We work with Carolina Brewing Company who did a wet hops for us last year. Just all these little things we do that can educate our guys all that more. We're constantly having tastings. We got a bar upstairs. We bring our staff in and retailers, teach them how to pour, proper pours, save money. The education, constant education. And that's just about craft beer, or is that about the specific brands that you're selling? Well, craft's the category. I mean, you know, Miller Fortune's coming out. We did a launch with it, and you got $40 million in advertisement coming. We, we wish them well. I think it's going to, you know, let's see if it doesn't turn out to be the next Miller Lite from 1975. I got my fingers crossed. <laughs> 
Sean, you got 45 million. To, uh, we can do some marketing, brother. <laughs> uh, there you go. I, I agree 100%, you know, with Jeff. It is the education. We've, we've done the same thing. Our guys are, you know, beer servers, and we've got, I think, four right now uh, certified. But uh, it's, it's, it, it is education. And you've got to be able to tell that restaurateur or that retailer, you know, this is what is cool and what's going on. Now, do they say, always listen? Well, actually, no. <laughs> actually, actually, a lot of our like retailers... Like my ex-wife. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of our retailers are way ahead of things. Mm. And they're hollering at us at like, you know, hey, you know, you know, what's going on with the latest Duck Rabbit you know, release? I see that it's out and my guy's not talking to me. So, no, you, you've got to stay on your toes because... Your retailers are extremely savvy, you right. know, about what's going on in the beer world. So are they informing you guys sometimes? Is it a, gi a give and a take? At times they know more than we do, yeah. just because they're reading the internet. No, our guys know. Jeff and I might not know, <laughs> but our beer guys really, really know. And they're totally aware, but uh, yeah. Um, so speaking about uh, specific brands. Let's, let's move back to the brewer because, you know, some of our audience members are, are going to want to, you know, take something away from tonight and say, all right, you know, maybe I'm going to think about having this conversation with my distributor. Um, when a brand isn't moving, uh, just a one singular brand for one of the breweries that might be one of your best, best breweries in your book. Um, when a brand isn't moving, how do you start having that conversation with them? How do you broach that conversation and, and say, look, like, we love what you're doing, but we, we don't particularly love this one beer because it's taken up space, it's, it, the retailers aren't responding to it, the consumers aren't responding to it. How do you start engaging your brewer without offending them? One of the first things that we do is we start taking a look at the points of distribution. Have we done what, we're, what we owe the, the brewers? Have we done our homework? Uh, you look at the points of distribution, the quality of the points of distribution, and then you start analyzing the rate of sale. Uh, usually what I use, I use a .3. If you're not doing a .3 uh, case a week, you know, a, a six pack a week, it's, <laughs> you, you're going to have trouble. I and mean, that's the threshold at Harris Teeter. That's where I get it from. Yeah. If you're not getting a .3, you're not a self-sustaining uh, skew. And then when, you, when I see that we've done the distribution and it's not hitting the threshold, it's time to sit down and start having a conversation. Is, is, it, is it pricing? Is it distribution? Is it the quality of the liquid? Is it consistency? What's wrong? Something's not right. And you, then you start having the conversations. And, and you identify what the problem is through these conversations? Or, I mean, how do you identify what? Because pricing and, and liquid are, I mean, two different things. You, you got to look at it all. And, and I'll say I have dropped some brands myself that I've, I've been wrong. You know, so if, if, don't, I don't bat a thousand myself, but you, you do look at it. You try to make an education guess. It's a business decision. Yeah. Right. And, and I've not been dropping the line items like I should. You know, I need to start focusing on that because there's some things that are not working with breweries that are really good. What I've done is had to look at the breweries themselves, you know, and I had to let go a good buddy of mine, a New York brewery, that just it wasn't working Who was you know, that? for our staff. I'm not going to tell you that, but uh, <laughs> I got to ask. They, they have a I'm Jewish listening. shtick, you know, ah, uh, and okay. <laughs> uh, it just it it wasn't working that well for us. And and how do I, I rank that and rate that? It's my sales staff. Right. I have to look, you know, listen to my sales because we're going to gold them on this, that, and the other. And at a certain point, when they say, "Hey, man." I've really tried, I've really tried, it ain't working, then, you know, and, 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 and that's a brand I did not sell that I just, I let go because he's a good friend of mine, you know, and, and that's what you got to do. And, and how did that conversation go? I mean, were they receptive to it? I know, he, he understood. Well, put it this way. If I'm not selling a whole lot of his stuff, you know, he's not so excited about having me as a wholesaler either. Right. So, I, you know, we were really good friends, and that was a really hard conversation. But 
you do what you got to do. And he appreciated it, and I'm sure he's in a better place. Hadn't seen it out here yet, but, you know, I'm sure he's in a better place. And, and Jeff, I know you've had to drop a, a, a few brands in your history as well. I mean, how, how have those conversations gone? Well, some of the uh, brewers are real good friends, and it's a very difficult conversation. And, um, but you have to have it, and, you know, I've not liked some of the conversations. It's, it's like firing somebody or breaking yeah. up with a girl. Oh, yeah. or exactly. It's very uncomfortable. You know, it's, Chris, I love you, man, but it ain't working. And in your interest, uh, we have to part paths. Right. Anything I can do to help you, let me know. And we do that. And it's usually just clean like that. I mean, you're not looking to sell the brand at all? Well, if it's a big one and we're not happy, we're going to have a divorce. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk a little more. Yeah. Right. So have you had to sell brands? Yeah, we've sold some brands. We, we have. We, we trade things every now and then. We, you can't try to keep up with the big breweries buying brands because they trade them so fast. I love the one with... Uh, Budweiser put Gross commercials on the Super Bowl, and then Miller bought the Gross Brewery. That was hilarious, <laughs> right? That was funny. Oh, yeah. No, I, I have definitely had to sell some brands because uh, we, we, we're we midsize. You know, I don't do every convenience store. And I've had some breweries come to me, and they want to be with an AB, you know, uh, mainly AB, I'm sorry. But uh, they want to be with an A-B distributor group. And, you know, I'm like, life is too short. You know, sure, I only want brands that want to be in my house. And if they think they need to be someplace else, you know, that's fine. Right. So, so you're, you're definitely... Write me a big check. Yeah. <laughs> so you're open to the conversation if uh, it, it's, it's not the best situation for no you. No question. You've yeah. got to be. Like I say, I know it's, it's a big uh, issue in a lot of states. There is so many brands out there, and if it, you know, you got to look at it like, you know, life is too short. You got to have your friends working with you. If somebody don't want to be there, fine. Right. You know, let's let's figure a way to get a divorce, and that's really what it is. And they have to pay the alimony, so I'm good. You know. <laughs> that 16 ounce cans have improved uh, brand sales in the grocery store for some of their brands. And one brand that they actually mentioned that had done really well with this was Sam Adams, which is not one of theirs. But they had seen that Sam Adams grocery sales were doing really well because they put 16 ounce cans in convenience stores, <coughs> in individual cans in convenience stores. So that was something unique, like so, it was a new trend. So the, the, qu the question is, Cans versus bottle sales, and then and placement, convenience store versus and then the different grocery, channels that are performing ounce, better with the yeah. different sizes yeah. and stuff. There were very large breweries a few years ago that swore they would never put their beer in cans because <laughs> might never say never. August Bush said he'd never make a light beer too. I'll say that. <laughs> uh, that really gets down to freight is what I think you're really talking about because you get 98 cases on a pallet versus 56. And uh, cans I know of bottles. 98 cases of cans, cans versus 56 bottles. cases of bottles. Yep. So the, you double your volume. Um, and, I, and I know Sierra Nevada, Ken Grossman, he did an improvement on the can for the liner and stuff like that. And right. he's made it available to the industry, uh, which compliments to Ken for doing that. So I think the, the cans for the sake of freight are a growing category, in, in my opinion. But bottles are known for, for the quality of the bottles, the prestigeness. And then I'll say uh, 16 ounce cans, that's a C store package initiative, purely driven by price point, in, in my opinion. Cans are cool. <laughs> cans are happening. All right, what you're doing right now is you're looking at the retard that 15 years ago when Oscar Blues was first coming out and I was the craft beer maven in this state at that time. I tasted in a Chubb, I tasted a Dale, you know, and I'm like, nobody is going to ever drink craft beer in a can. <laughs> I mean, I mean, because I thought I knew it all and lo and behold, uh, you know, some of the best things never work, but... The uh, crap here in the cans is definitely happening. I'm all about it. Uh, the four pack, 16 ounce, I think, is going to be one of the bigger 
pulls that we're going to see start happening in craft. So, uh, yes, yes, we're seeing an increase. Well, what we're seeing are people getting, you know, canned lines, and we're seeing, you know, right now a mobile, you know, can line, which is crazy. I mean, the, the wineries have done it forever, uh, and so now some smart individuals said, let's do mobile canning lines, and that's cool. So, no, I think cans are here to stay. It, it honestly is a better package for the beer because you're not getting any of the light in through the glass but, you know, that you get. But at the end of the day, it's still somewhere between like 5 and 8% of, of total volume yeah. for any brewery. Uh, it, it, and and for probably a while. like 3 3 or 4% of, of the entire you know, beer volume. For a while. You know, cans are cool. Cans are going to keep coming. So you, you uh, think that's going to grow? Oh, I know it's going to grow. Because all my guys are buying can lines now. I mean, hell, they've not even done it yet. They all have bottling lines. So, yeah. so, so how are you guys as wholesalers helping to educate not only retailers but consumers uh, that the can is a better package like you've pointed out? And, and how are you guys uh, starting to take shelf space with these SKUs? We don't have to take it. It's taken itself. I mean, you know, the buyers are looking at cans now and going, cans are cool, you know, and they need to make space for them. You know what? They can get more cans in a single location than they can bottles. Right. And, you know, they're all about uh, their real estate, you know. So how are they making space? Are they taking away or are they just adding more space for cans? No, uh, it's... it's they're adding space for craft as we go. So that gives more space for cans at the same time. But no, it's, it's not like they're saying, throw the bottle out, just do the can. You know. Sure. And uh, Jeff, I, I really want to ask you this. Um, we touched on C stores and, and can packages, and, and you're saying that's you know, a really big avenue for uh, craft brewers to access. Um, how are these C-Store retailers talking about uh, uh, what they want from cans? I mean, there's, there's limited space in C-Stores. They, they, they operate with very limited amounts of SKUs. Um, some of the C-Store operators that we've talked to are looking at like, you know, maybe 10 to 15 SKUs of craft total. So h how do cans fit into that for the C-Store operators? Cans being a preferred package for that type of consumer who's looking for the can. And it's mainly, Chris, going to get down to the major national brands who do the support. You know, Sam Adams, you know, Jim Cook's on TV all the time. Sierra Nevada being in North Carolina, that doesn't hurt. And then Oscar Blues, and uh, there, there's several others. But it's going to be the major national brands. They don't have the room. So it's just got to, it's going to be the big guns. Yep. And so, so can the local uh, operators with their local cans access those, those channels? I'd say the local big guys. Okay. So a, reg a large regional. Yeah, large regional, the big guys, because there's only so much space. Okay. Right. I think Highlands, you know, I think that Highlands up in the mountains are, is in sea stores but no, no other place in the state. But they're still willing to work on them in a regional basis. Sure, sure. Um, so, one final question before uh, we break here, Total. Um, you know, we've, we've kind of been talking about all the different SKUs, all the different brands that are out there, the different packages, all the innovation. Um, how long can the craft beer category sustain all of this growth? Uh, where do you guys sort of see the category going? How many new brands can uh, all these retailers handle? Um, I don't want to ask the bubble burst question, but just kind of your vision of the future for craft, you know, wh where do you see all these going? Thank you. All right. That's a tough question. I know. <laughs> what I am looking at right now is what the, the Pacific Northwest is doing, a 34%, 32% share. We're at a 7% share. Right. And that's Portland, Oregon, I think. Yeah. yeah. I, I know the growth that we have in front of us. Now, is it the growth with the multitude, you know, of new breweries that open every day? I don't think so. You know, I think there's going to be players out there that stand up in this market and are going to be the people 
that make it happen. We're watching it now. I mean, guys that just say, oh, uh, you know, I, I brewed a batch of craft beer. You know, I'm going to try to brew beer now and, and be a brewer. Those guys, and so many of them are underfunded, you know, are, are not really going to make it, you know. But the people that, you know, have got their feet on the ground, got it going on, they're going to grow and grow and grow. I mean, uh, you know, we will see, you know, these guys hit that, you know, 32%. Right. Jeff, your view of the future? Oh, he's got one. Yeah. Um, maybe. Am I on? Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Yeah, all right. Sorry. Um, I think that, uh, like I say, there's going to be some sort of fallout. All these microbreweries expanding, they're going to hit a wall. And I think they're going to get to a point in my crystal ball that there could be a price war amongst micros, which when you throw in the freight factor, we don't want to see this. But if you get people who get desperate, who have got these bank loans, they got to pay, they're going to do something. Thank you. Yeah. Should have gave you. The oh, 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 oh. I should have gave him that one in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, uh, like I say, something's going to happen with with these breweries. Everyone's investing in the capital and stuff, and it's going to get to the point where it's going to be saturated, where you can't get any more of your brands into the Harris Teeters or Food Line if you're fortunate. And so I think people are going to start discounting. I don't want to see that, but it's going to become a, a price war in the micro sector because the, the, the PTC is getting so high, someone's going to come in at a lower tier at some point. And um, I, I think that's going to be a big, a big problem. Then you can throw in, um, like I say, a hop shortage. While you're on this topic, actually. While you're on this, sorry, you're on this topic of grocery stores and people coming in at a cheaper price, how do they feel about quality beer? Like, do they actually know what they're tasting and buying? And Have you ever had tequiza? <laughs> <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> Equality's there, and that's going to be a problem, and, and I see that. Well, I mean, what he's talking about is that if there is this massive amount of local craft, at a certain point, these guys are going to have to get, you know, to compete, they're going to start getting down and dirty, and we're going to watch a lot of guys fall off the cliff because the last thing you can do if you're struggling is sell your stuff too cheap. Right. But if they think that, oh, yeah, I'm losing a dollar a case. I'll make it up in volume. You know, you know that doesn't work. Yeah, interesting. Well, uh, cer certainly some good points. Uh, I, I think probably, uh, you know, some questions for you guys personally maybe that we can have uh, over, over a beer at the bar. Um, thank you guys for, for joining me up here. Jeff and Brad, how about a round of applause for these guys?